So if I had to give today's message a title, it would be called Remember Me. And um, we can, listen, now when I say turn to this, don't get scared, okay? Turn to Revelation <laughs> 2. Is where as soon as you say Revelation, the room just go, <gasps> it's like, y'all need to read it. It's called a Revelation of Jesus Christ. You don't even really know Jesus all the way if you ain't never read the book of Revelation. Like, you don't got to be scared. That's Satan trying to keep you away from truth. You need to read the whole Bible. But we're going to read Revelation 2 today. <clears throat> so remember me. We're going to hop in there. When I was growing up, I, like, loved basketball. Like, I thought at one point I was going to play professionally. And I would say that basketball was my first love since I was about four years old. If I didn't have a basketball rim, I would go outside all day and just dribble. So I had really good ball handling skills because we didn't have a hoop. And then when we moved up to the east side, then we got a basketball rim. So then I became a great shooter. But I was like dedicated. Anybody who knew me, you knew basketball. Like I would go to camps. I remember writing a paper when I was 11, got in the front page of the newspaper. I got to go to Michael Jordan camp for free. Like, I just really was invested. And then the older I grew, then I started getting introduced to other things. So then I started dancing, and I started running track. I started running cross country, and I started having a boyfriend and going to the mall with friends. And I didn't, I, didn't, I mean, it wasn't that I didn't still love basketball. It was just that it was no longer my first love because I had other options. It wasn't, I wasn't as invested. Maybe I would go play outside sometimes, maybe not. I wasn't as passionate about it. And it didn't happen right away. It happened over time. And before I knew it, I got injured my senior year. So my hoop dreams died with that injury. And then I went to college and had an opportunity to play and I turned it down because I didn't love it as much. And I'm like, man, this is what I always wanted to do. And when presented with the opportunity, I didn't do it. And I recognized that there was this slow drift away from basketball. What it meant to me at four, at 22, it didn't mean the same. And sometimes I like still sit and wonder like, man, what happened? When did my love fade? When did it start to die? And as I was reflecting on that, I thought about how oftentimes that happens in our relationship with Jesus. We start off zealous. When we first meet Jesus, we want to tell everybody on the bus, on the train. We call in family members and asking them, do they want to go to church? We are just going after it. And then over time, other things start to create space. And between that passion that we had for Jesus, then that passion becomes about the next relationship. Or that passion becomes about serving. Or that passion becomes about people knowing our name. And then sharing the scripture becomes less about sharing the scripture because people need to hear the word. And more about how many people are going to like this post. Like some, somehow the passion doesn't necessarily always fade. It just shifts. And so when we step into this story, we come across this letter that Jesus is writing to his churches. Uh, the author of Revelation is John, and John has this vision where he sees Jesus, and then Jesus gives these angels that he's holding in his hand these letters to these churches. And this letter that we're going to read today is to the church of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is one of the most popular churches, the most influential. It's in the biggest cities one of the fourth largest cities in this whole little dynamic, and Jesus is writing to them. If we had to bring this church and place it in 2024, it would be a church. <laughs> I almost got in trouble. Um, it would be a church that would make us say, man, we want to be like that church. Like this would be a church holding conferences to teach other churches how to be like them. They had all the baptisms. They had all the people joining their church. They did everything right. They had 75% of their church in small groups. They have 20, uh, I don't know, I'm bad with numbers, 80% serving, you know, on teams and stuff. Like this would be the premier church of all the churches. But then Jesus pulls their card. Because I think Pastor Steph said it last night. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. 
And so as we jump into this letter, I don't want you to just listen to it like we're talking about a church because you people, we, us, we are God's ecclesia. We are his church. So we make up the church body. Uh, I think it's Ephesians tells us that God places us in the body as he sees fit. That's part of the issue because most of us want to be where we want to be. Nobody wants to be the baby toe. Everybody want to be the nose or the hands. We want to be the visible parts of the body. But the reality is that if God places us where he sees fit and we go where we want to be, some part of the body is lacking because you are not in place. So let's go to Revelation. Y'all with me? All right. We're going to start at verse 1. Um, I'm going to read it in the Amplified because it amplifies it. It's just what I heard. <laughs> Uh, to the angel, divine messenger of the church in Ephesus, write, these are the words of the one who holds firmly the seven stars, which are the angels or messengers of the seven churches in his right hand. The one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, the seven churches. Now, if I give you some backstory in John when John has a dream Jesus is in the middle of the seven churches and that seems a little interesting if you're thinking about Jesus and authority like wouldn't he be over the churches if he's but he's right in the middle of them because he's trying to give the picture that the center of your church the center of your ministry should revolve around Jesus he should be the center of it not your popularity not your empire you trying to build not you know what I'm saying like Jesus should be the center okay I told you not to just listen like we're talking about a church of your life and what you build and your purpose and the thing that you're creating, Jesus, should be at the center of it. Be because if it's for other reasons, it ain't going to last. And we real good about doing stuff to feed our own ego and then slapping Jesus on it and making wanting him to bless something he was never even a part of. So while you're going through things and you're looking through, you know, the stuff you build in and your dreams and your desires, you need to check to see, Jesus, are you at the center of it? All right, I'm going to stay back here. Because y'all eyeballing me. All right. So um, he says, I know your deeds and your toil and your patient endurance and that you cannot tolerate those who are evil. And you've tested and critically appraised those who call themselves apostles, special messengers, personally chosen representatives of Christ. And in fact, are not and have found them to be liars and imposters. So Jesus is, I had a mentor who before he would tell me anything bad, he would always give me like compliments. He go, Brenda, you did such a good job, you know, pulling that team together. You guys really got it done. And then he would go, but <laughs> I'm like, bro, save all this good stuff. Just give it to me straight. But Jesus is telling the church, like, man, I know you guys are doing all the things I asked you to do. You've been patiently enduring. You've been handling uh, criticism. You've even been calling out false prophets. I know y'all know what that means because it's, I mean, people have made it their day job. It's really wearing me out. Like, y'all, we get it. We get it. Okay, their doctrine is not sound. Okay. The Bible told us it would happen. And is your doctrine sound if all of your doctrine is about how somebody else's doctrine is not sound? Who is preaching the word? I am fed up. <laughs> oh, my. We get it. We get it. Okay. It's not sound doctrine. But the best way to teach people sound doctrine is to teach people sound doctrine. I'm sorry. Y'all ain't asked for that. But Jesus. I... <sighs> I am tired. Okay. It's like nobody's preaching the gospel. Well, if you preached it, then I would be able to identify that this gospel that aligns with my word does not sound like this gospel. Therefore, I can separate it. Okay, I'm going to go here. Ephesians 5 tells us that as, as believers, it is our job to expose the darkness. We have an issue because we think exposure is canceling people on the internet or making a 90 second video to break down somebody's misuse of scripture. Now, do you know how light exposes darkness? It just is the light. 
it just steps into the darkness and you recognize that the light doesn't look I, I am again y'all didn't ask for this but we are the body of Christ and we are literally taking ourselves out from the inside like it, I, I can't take no more of it I'm tired of it so read your Bible okay and you will be able to discern. Man, Pastor Steph laid it out yesterday with that spiritual consciousness. I, too, was convicted because sometimes I'd be stepping up and stuff like I'm a normal person and then be finding myself toe off. Like, I had no business in this relationship because Satan sent you. You better wake up and expose the dark by being the light. It's how we do it because people need to hear truth and they can't hear it with all the noise. Like, ugh, all right. So the, anyway, this is the most influential church. And Jesus is like, y'all are killing it. I mean, on every front. For, I'm going to bring it down to us. You go to church every week. You serve on the teams. You be early. You invite five people every week to church. Sometimes you sit on the front row. You pray for all the people at your job. You do all the things the Lord tells you to do. You don't be listening to false prophets. You don't be going to the Beyonce concert. You don't be smoking weed. Like you don't be having sex. Just look straight ahead. You be doing all the things. <laughs> oh, I don't know your business, uh, <laughs> but you in the room. So um, just straight ahead. You be doing all the stuff, all the stuff that makes you a believer. And then Jesus says, and I know that you who believe are enduring patiently and are bearing up for my name's sake, and that you have not grown weary of being faithful to truth. So even when you suffer, you're still declaring that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is like, good job, hats off to you, but... I have this charge against you that you have left your first love. You have lost the depth of love that you first had for me. Because oftentimes when we are doing things for God, we forget that our for God flows from our love for him. So then it becomes about keeping up a facade. It becomes about you pursuing power and platforms. I just never, I just don't understand how we think that coming to church is about serving on the team so we could become the leader, so we could grab the mic and stand behind a pulpit. I don't understand why that's your greatest aspiration. Bro, don't nobody care about this up here. Are you, are you saving the lives that you see every day? Are you telling them about Jesus? Matter of fact, don't tell them nothing. Are you living so they are attracted to the Jesus that you say you follow? Man, I, I'm so tired of this system. Church is so that you can be equipped. We wouldn't have to keep exposing false prophets if we preach the word at church so you recognize what sound doctrine sounds like so you can be developed and equipped and go make disciples because that's what you exist for. And Jesus is telling them, you doing all the stuff that you think makes you a believer in a church, but I'm looking at your heart and it's raggedy. So no, I'm not impressed by all the stuff you're doing and calling all the false prophets out and coming to church every week and staying true to the word because you don't even like your neighbor. Your heart is raggedy. Your heart is impure. Your motives are trash. You really after all these things so somebody can say, man, they really doing that. You better sit down. And Jesus is letting them know, I know that the world thinks you're the most influential church, but I'm telling you, your heart is far from me. If I asked you, were you saved? Majority of the people in this room, your hands would go up. My follow up question would be, how do you know? Is it because you said a sinner's prayer? Because that's not even in the Bible, but that's not why we're here. Is it because you said a sinner's prayer? Is it because you raised your hand? Is it because you said, I follow Jesus? Or is it because you serve on all the teams and you go to church every week and you lead worship and you do all the things? What, what qualifies you as a believer? 
Most people don't even know why they're saved. We love a good, I love Jesus. Do you really? Do you really know what it means to love Jesus? Do you know what it means to be a follower of him? Because the Bible says, if any man want to be a follower of Jesus, he must deny himself. We like to skip that part of it. Take up your cross. and find, Before you take up your cross, you need to deny yourself. I know in the world they told you self-denial was bad. But the way we live on this side of the kingdom is you need to deny yourself. Your desires, your flesh, your purpose, your will, your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings. Because the church loves to talk about how they feel. Self-denial is how I identify that you are a believer. If you, if you say that you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, let's make that clear, and, and Jesus Christ, the one that we read about in the Bible, because I know there are a lot of versions of him floating around right now, but Jesus Christ of the Bible, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ of the Bible, how do I know that if I wasn't there the day you said the prayer? How do I identify a believer in a crowd of people? How, how you living? Because most of us would identify our ability to be identified as a believer by all the things I just told you that Jesus just told these people they do. I suffer. I suffer for the Lord. I do. All my life, I had a fight. You suffering? You holding true to the faith. Jesus said, but I got this charge from you. You don't love me no more. I had told it on the live. Because before I get to get you with this, he got me with it. Because we could get in the motion of doing the stuff and not even realize we've left Jesus. I came out of the came out of the dark into the light. I chose to follow Jesus. And when I first got here, serving was about pleasing Jesus. I didn't care if the pastor ever mentioned my name. I didn't care if anybody ever saw me. I was the first one in, the last one out, because I just wanted to serve Jesus. And then over time, don't nobody ever tell me thank you. They didn't know I was here all night. I'm just a volunteer. I don't even know if I could go. I got other stuff to do. Do I want to go to church? That worship wasn't really hidden last week. I, I know what's in the room. And you think you're just having a moment. And little by little, you're drifting. You, J Jesus doesn't leave us. We leave him. And little by little, you find yourself entertaining people that reflect the life he delivered you from. It's a slow drift. It's not, it's not one huge decision that gets you in Jesus and out of him. No, 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 no. Most of the time, it's offense. Something big or small hits your heart and goes unresolved. Now the enemy has access. Now your vision is obscured. You can't even see things clearly. So when your, when, when your leader says, hey, we missed you at church today, you hear why you didn't show up to serve. Because your lens is offense. So they trying to because the next one will be like, don't nobody even care if I don't show up. I just asked you. Please, what make up your mind? It, I'm trying to care. But, but when offense hits your heart and it's unresolved, it becomes the lens in which you live life. Now you're the victim in everything. So you go to slow drift. You were serving. You was after God. I love God. And you want to come to my church? I love my church. This is the greatest place on earth. Oh, my God. That's fine. <laughs> Jesus. Sometimes it's a cop-out 
to keep inviting people to your church because you don't actually know the Jesus you're representing and the only cards you got to play is your church until they get mad, until you get mad at them. So the real thing is this relationship with Jesus needs to be about Jesus. If it's not everything that's supposed to represent Jesus that disappoints you, now you up off Jesus because now you're mad at people. That's why you need to know Jesus for yourself. Coming to church on Sunday is like the shot of espresso. It, 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 it ain't going to hold you, bruh. It ain't going to hold you. you. You need to develop a relationship over here where you understand his nature and his heart and what things mean. So when you step in to serve in your local church, it is about pleasing the Lord. I don't care if nobody call my name. I don't care if they be like, who was that one girl? So and so, so all I know is she really be serving because you don't care nothing about these people. I'm serving as unto the Lord. So when offense hits your heart, it goes, Lord, deal with my heart so I can see your people the way that you see them so I can stay in place. Because if the Lord places you in the body as he sees fit, the moment you are offended, you get out of place. Now the body is limp. Slow drift. Now you have to go to church. And now them people that you wasn't fooling with when you was over here loving the Lord, be like, I'm sorry, girl, I can't even talk to you no more because I really love Jesus. I'm locked in. I'm with Jesus. We are. All I need is Jesus. You got to get these people up out of my circle. I had to cut them off. Now you did the people you didn't cut off when you was really rocking with Jesus. Now your hearts are fitting. Now you're like, hey, what y'all doing? All Satan needs is a door. And most of us, he ain't even got a knock on it. We like, come on in. Take a seat. Let's fool with this. Let, let's see how far I can go without really going. And you don't recognize you are participating in your slow drift. But we are really good at church about pretending. So you still showing up. You still doing all the things. But we can tell your heart is off because you can't hide an impure heart. Because it comes up even when you're trying to hide it. When somebody says something, you get in that little corner, you be like, yeah, because I know, girl, because so-and-so, check your heart. When your response is always negative, check your heart and shut it up. Because what you fail to realize is you are planting seeds that you will reap. So if you ain't got nothing good to say, you better zip that lip because you're going to eat that. That's Bible. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed, time, and harvest. That's not just your money. All right. I don't even... Slow drift, right? You start fooling with the people who reflect your old life. I'm giving you the game because when you're in it, you can't recognize it. I was telling you all about my own business because... I was trying to figure out where the door was, okay? So I was like really, really rocking with Jesus. I was really locked in. I counted it a privilege that God would lose, like use me. I was like, oh my goodness, little old me. What was happening? You know, traveling all over the world, doing all the things. And then I got about, if I could go back there to the wall, I would. Because I got all the way over here and I was like, I don't want to do this no more. How did I get over here? I'm doing all the things for God. I'm, do, I'm doing all the things for God, but I left him over here. I'm going to tell y'all where I left him. I was offended. I was offended by the world. <laughs> I'm like, I'm tired of this. I, I, I took a bold step of obedience for the Lord. And it felt like my life came crashing down. And I was offended. Hit my heart. And little by little, I started drifting. Because I'm trying to figure out, hey, Lord, I did this for you. Are you just going to be letting these people do this? Drift. So then it's like, oh, I need to take a break. But the break, first of all, ain't no rest apart from God. This, I don't know where we got that from. Oh, I'm just resting. 
And are you doing all the things that don't include God? That's not rest. It's giving trap. Set up. It's drifting on a... Just drifting. You are drifting on a memory of who God was, and you have gone away from him. And then I started paying attention to my circle. And I'm like, who are these people? And then I recognized where I was once boldly declaring things, now I'm drift. It's a slow drift. You have, I went kayaking one time, worst decision of my life. Guess what happens when you move to, to people that are not like you? <laughs> and you start to think you can do things they do. And I found myself in the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> kayaking. I didn't belong there. I'm, I'm from Chicago. I was trying to figure out how I got in the middle, and I saw a whale and thought it was a shark and thought my life was over. If I, <laughs> I said, this is what happens when you move with others. Because <laughs> somebody should have said, girl, we don't do this. I was already, I was already there. I was already committed. And I recognized that at one point my arms had got tired. I was like, I'm sick of this. And I don't know who talked me into this. And I just sat there. And then I looked up and I was further away from the shore, which meant I was gonna have to work harder to get back. But I had just gave up. I, 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 I stopped. I stopped putting the work in because my arms were tired. And I was relying on my own strength and I didn't have it no more. And by the time I looked up, the shore was way further than I would have been because I just gave up. And some of us in our journeys of faith, when it gets hard, we want to just. And now we have slowly drifted out of position. And this is the thing, bro. Satan is a punk because he ain't do nothing. The, this journey is a product of my decisions apart from the counsel of the Lord. Because remember, Jesus says you have left your first love. It didn't say he left me. It didn't even say I lost him. At some point, I made a decision that I could do this on my own. And we don't blatantly make that decision. We start making decisions without him and we drift. So I ended up in friendships, people just coming out of nowhere. I'm like, well, I like this person. They, oh. I ain't never once asked God, who is this? Where, where do they belong? A am I supposed to be discipling them? Instead, I'm gossiping with them. Because y'all like to talk about the big sins. Because y'all like to make big and little. Sin is sin, child. Missing the mark. Okay? It's doing bad things. And it's not doing good things when you know the both sides. Sin. Miss the mark. Boop. So... I recognized I was trying to escape my offense. And instead of asking the Lord to deal with my heart, I started creating a life for myself. Still doing all the things. Because we're good at that. We're going to make sure we show up. We're going to make sure we drop that little quote on threads. Hashtag safe life. Whatever y'all be doing. I don't know. Y'all still hashtag and stuff. But whatever gives the appearance that I'm still locked in with Jesus. And Jesus is talking to this church and he's saying, I get y'all doing all the things. I get that everybody in the whole wide world is impressed, but I'm not. It's how we get to the scripture in Matthew where we stand before the throne. We're talking to Jesus. He says, prophesied in my name. Cast out demons. You perform miracles. I never knew you. Could you imagine sacrificing 
whatever you think you sacrifice, because he's Jesus, so it doesn't make a match to him. Doing all of that your whole life, and you get up there, and he's like, who are you? <laughs> you don't know me? <laughs> what you mean? You know how many times I didn't have sex? You know how many times I wanted to grab that blunt, and I was like, no, no, nah, I serve Jesus. I can't even get in the rotation. You know how many times I want to say, forgive them. You don't know me. No, nah, because your heart is raggedy. Ooh. Be- because the fact that verse proves where their hearts were. Because they trying to run down what they did to Jesus. I prophesied. I did all that. Who cares? Jesus died so that you could have fellowship and intimacy with him. Not so you could do miracles and give people prophetic words on the internet. <laughs> Tired of it. Pray about it. We don't want your words. Jesus. And can, all of y'all can't be prophets. All of y'all. Everybody. That's the only gift he's passing out. Is the one who prophecy. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody kind. Nobody want to sow seeds. Nobody want to be administrative. These are all gifts. And we've been obsessed with the ones. That... Yeah, I'm sorry. I've been... I've been locked away for 30 days, okay? And it's just bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling. I, I just want us to reflect the totality of gifts. And if you read the Bible, when prophets, y'all didn't ask for this, it's free, okay? <laughs> when prophets was given a word, it would grieve them. It, it, it would. It, I mean, the Lord had to basically threaten Ezekiel. He said, hey, boy, if I give you something to say and you don't say it and they die in their sin, that's on you. Nobody has to say that to somebody who's thirsty to give a word because clearly they ain't struggling in that area. I'm just saying, just read your Bible. Just read your Bible. That was, I don't even know what we was talking about. <laughs> Y'all didn't let me drifting. I drifted. That's what happened. Jesus. <laughs> Lord help us. All right. I got to finish the message. Okay. Whew. After he tells them that they have drifted and left their first love, I love that Jesus is a solutionist. He doesn't just trash you and be like you suck like that's not his heart so even when people be like articulating the heart of God that way gentleness is a fruit of the spirit it's okay to be gentle and say hey babe you drifted some people need like girl get it together you've drifted all right um will can y'all come real fast I feel like we needed a picture because Jesus is just telling this church, like, y'all got it, but you're missing the intricate piece. You're missing what makes you effective and what gives you impact. Because you guys just hug like like a hug. Oh, I love that. I said we needed a married couple. We needed it. We did. I, I was, hello, come on. Um. Praise the Lord. So this, this is, <laughs> they're so cute. Like, I, it's really giving. Come on. It's really giving. So th- this, is, this is us first Jesus. Go ahead. Hug it out. Hug it out. I mean, we are locked in. It's like, oh, my gosh. I love Jesus. This is the honeymoon stage. We have that with Jesus, too. We just, oh, everything makes you think about him. Just like, <laughs> you're like, oh, look at the clouds. 
<laughs> is that a hand? God, is that your hand on me? Oh. Which is, is honeymoon. We, we are honeymooning it out with Jesus. Somebody said, they called, they said, oh, God bless you. Let me pray. Let me pray. Do you know that you're blessed? You walk in a coffee store. You're like, oh my gosh, can I get that for you? You want it. You just want to do it all. It's the honeymoon. Okay. And then, you know, life starts happening. You know, subjects creates, you know, just, I just want to stand in here. Y'all good. <laughs> just want to stand in here. Just. Okay. So, you know, just stuff happens. You, you join that church and they told you, this will be the best decision you ever made. You give this seed, God's going to turn it around. You shout three times, breakthrough. Stop that. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not. It's not. Jesus, <laughs> so you're disappointed. And, 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 and we don't recognize the weight of disappointment. The disappointment sits on you. And, and it, it chips away at your faith little by little. So you, you, you say, man, God's a healer. You was boldly declaring it. And then when he doesn't heal according to your timing or your expectation, the next time you step into a situation and you need him to be a healer, you like, God's a healer, but we love a good but. And it's like, no, 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 God's a healer. When I, I, I was like finishing my book or whatever, Jesus help us. Hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. I recognize I had a lot of warfare. And I come out of it. I finally turn it in. And my mom calls me. So I don't know if I told y'all this last year. Because y'all know last year I had quit my job. Ooh, still quit. Um, <laughs> we still trying to figure it out. Um, but at the same time, my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So we're taking like two journeys, faith journeys at the same time. He had surgery last August. They say like cancer free. Amen. So I finished my book, July. My mom calls. She's like, hey, we didn't want to tell you why you know you write your book, but we went to the doctor and they said the numbers is back up and he got to do chemo. What? But I had just come out of like months of warfare mentally. And I finally like, whoo, I'm back. And then that happens. I said, no, nah, sucker, I see you, Satan. I said, hey, go get a second opinion. And I got off the phone and I said out loud, I'm still going to declare that God is a healer. Because I recognize that the enemy is trying to chip away at my faith. And I already know my daddy's healed. So I don't care what the doctor said. Go back and get a second opinion because God's a healer. And he either going to heal him now or he's going to heal later. But I'm not going to change my mind about who God is. A week goes by. We go get a second opinion. The doctor said, child, these numbers ain't moved at all. If he would have went to see a radiologist, they would have said, chemo for what? He's fine. Two weeks ago, we got his numbers have gone down beyond the first level. Because the enemy's just looking for your agreement. Your agreement is what gives him authority. So don't allow disappointment to chip away. When disappointment comes, I'm like, oh, I got to strap up. I got to pull out my big guns and I got to intercede because God's word is true. He cannot lie. I'm sorry. Get back to my. I'm horrible at this. I'm going to try to stay focused. Okay. Chip the way. All right. And it, it creates this distance. I needed you to see this picture. Because even though she's living life reflective of God and Jesus is saying, you've drifted, this is his forever posture. He, you don't drift from God and then he goes, no, he is forever pursuing you with arms open wide. So even when he's reading this letter to the church, he's saying, hey, you forgot about me and I'm calling you out because I'm trying to call you in. He's never calling us out to make us feel shameful or condemned. He's calling you out to call you in. He's drawing you back in. So whenever you feel like, man, I really messed up, like my little heart was broken because I had ended up all the way over here. And I had declared in my heart, like, I'm a person that be saying stuff all the time, just be saying stuff. But I had sat on my couch and I really was done. Like, 
I can't even articulate how done I was. I just was really over it. And when I said it out of my mouth, I went, I meant that. And, and I said, God, how did I get here? Because how could I ever sit in a seat of authority that you gave me and tell you that I don't want it because of people? I, I lost my first love. I drifted because this was never about them and, and what they thought or pleasing them. It was always about pleasing you. So how could I sit here and tell you I don't want it anymore because of them? And that's how the drift happens. Because somewhere along the way, the object of my affection shifted. I took my eyes off of Jesus and I started focusing on what they were saying and how they were feeling. And the entire time Jesus is standing here looking at me like, Brenda, remember me. And I'm saying the same thing to you. Hey, if you're paying attention to what happens in the world, I'm having conversations with people who are saying, I don't even want to talk about my faith because of how the church is showing up in the world. Remember Jesus. Because here's the truth. It was not sinners that crucified Jesus. It was religious leaders. So who cares what they say? If what God is telling you to do aligns with his word, that's all that matters. Remember Jesus. So he's a solutionist. Thank y'all, because I will have y'all standing here the whole time. I'm really bad at illustrations. Hope that worked for y'all. He said, <laughs> he said, so remember the heights from which you have fallen. I, I just want you to, in this moment, remember what it felt like when you first said yes to Jesus. J just remember, I love that Lizzie was so in the bag with, you weren't there the night he found me, but you was there. And whenever life gets hard and you feel like giving up and walking away from Jesus, remember where you were when he found you. Remember how he pursued you. Remember how he came after you when you were so undeserving. I'm like, this is the God who sees when I'm not even worthy of his glance. I'm not even worthy for him to look at me and he sees me and allows himself to be seen. He's that kind of God. Remember Jesus. Remember. R remember how your heart used to skip a beat when you would just think about it. We could get so lost in the things, in the task of trying to show up with the appearance of loving Jesus that we forget to actually love him. What does it look like to love Jesus? Jesus, go to 1 John 5. I'm sorry, y'all. I am. Can I take a little bit more time? Okay. Sorry. I got to give you the word. It's because I feel very at home here. So y'all just be... Uh, let's go to 1 John 5. <clears throat> I'm going to read it in the Amplified. I'm going to read 1 John 5. I'm going to read 1 through 5. It says, <clears throat> Everyone who believes with a deep abiding trust in the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, is born of God, that is reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose. And everyone who loves the father also loves the child born of him. That's Jesus. By this we know without any doubt that we love the children of God. Expressing that love when we love God and obey his commandments. For the true love of God is this that we habitually keep his commandments and remain focused on his precepts. So when you be like, I love God, you don't love God? What's wrong with you? Y'all are bad, y'all are bad, y'all are bad. <laughs> I did. 
I did, I did, I did that, I did. Hey, but how do we know if you love God? You obey his commandments. So when I asked you, how do you know that you're a follower of Jesus? His commandment says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, strength. Those words. What does that look like? It means he's the one who holds the object of our affection. He, there, nothing overrides him. The drift doesn't just happen with like bad decisions. It's also when you're chasing your bag and you're trying to get rich and you're trying to blow up and you want people to know your name. It's anything that takes your focus off of him. The, the drift is slow. But in today's times, we have a lot of opportunities to drift because the enemy's job is that you don't make it to the place in which God predestined for you. So you're on this journey with Jesus and he is 10 times working hard to throw things in your way. Most of them are your bad decisions because you chase and pursue Jesus without him, which that doesn't make any sense. And it, Y'all, it really looks like before you step into anything, before you make any decisions, before you enter into any relationships, it goes, God, what do you want me to do? What is your will for this? A new, I'm, in 2024, I'm questioning everything. Okay? Because it looks like a duck, but it could be a chicken. I don't, <laughs> it's given, deception is at an all-time high. Okay? So, it, I, man, because Steph was all in my message yesterday. But like when people come and they're like, oh my God, I so love you. Why? You don't even know me. You think you love me. And I want to know why you think you love me. No, I don't even want to. Actually, I don't want to find out. Actually, the door is closed. At this, for real, I can't even play with it, y'all. If I, I don't have time to tell you about my year. Because the drift was, I was drawn by the people I was letting in my space. And it came from fear. I ain't going to hold you. I was afraid of, I wasn't lonely. I was afraid of being lonely. So I started creating an environment to ensure that I wouldn't be lonely. And I never asked the Lord who should go in the environment. So now I'm connecting to people, calling them covenant. Fr the word friend ain't for everybody. Okay. Be because if they are not surrendered and submitted to the Lord, they are working on behalf of Satan and they can be used at any time. So, no, no, you need to ask the Lord, who is this and where do you want them in my life? Because I was bringing people close. And I'm supposed to be discipling. And I'm like, oh, so now I got to reverse engineer and just be cutting people off. Break, just, I'm so sorry. This is not a reflection of Jesus. It is a reflection of my bad decision. And you got to go. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It is that serious. We talk about stewarding gifts. You are a gift that God entrusted to you. You got to steward yourself and your anointing. Because you think people are attracted to you. No, they are attracted to the oil on your life. And they are only here to corrupt it so that it doesn't produce what it's supposed to. You better... Lock it up. All right. Remember. Then he says, repent. Turn away. You can play medicationally because I'm done. Jesus. <laughs> repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior, and seek God's will. Which means, God, we don't want to just have the appearance of following you. We, we want to deny ourselves. We want to live according to what the Spirit of God leads us to do. Which means we, our decisions reflect God and his heart. And sometimes that means staying in a place that offends you because it means serving the Lord. Y'all think Jesus didn't know who Judas was? He, he was fully God and fully man. But he knew where to place Judas. He also served him. Washed his feet. Bro, we have to start reflecting the heart of God. Just because somebody hurts your feelings, don't mean you get to cut them off because you don't like the way they made you feel. 
The Bible tells us to pursue peace. The last part is, and do the works you did at first when you first knew me. Otherwise, I'll visit you and remove your lampstand, the church, its impact from its place unless you repent. Really quickly, for God to remove his lampstand, he removes the anointing and the oil. And it is the anointing that destroys the yoke and removes the burdens. Could you, could you fathom interceding for somebody to be saved and it doesn't happen? Could you imagine coming in here every week and lives not being changed because God isn't showing up? We do not want this place without his presence. And you don't want God to remove his presence from a thing and it has the appearance of being effective and it's not changing anything. This city that this church exists in is too important to be ineffective. So remember, repent and do. What do I do? Here's our heart, heart posture. One thing I have asked of the Lord and that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in his presence all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty, the delightful loveliness and majestic grandeur of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. May we never get common with our fixation on Jesus. Don't, don't lose the awe. Don't lose the wonder. Don't lose the, God, why me? I know I don't deserve it, but thank you for choosing me anyway. Remember what it felt like when you first fell in love with Jesus. Don't allow the stuff to make you lose sight of who he is. So here's your moment. God is standing with his arms open wide. He says, you left your first love, but I never left you. I'm right wherever you dropped me, wherever you got fed up and tired and blamed him for them. He's just saying, I need you to remember, but I also need you to repent. It's more than lip service. It's saying, man, from this day forward, God, I'm going to fix my eyes on you. Y'all, it's, that is the, it's helped me. Because people be weird. And when they do weird stuff, I be wanting to react. And now it's like a, it's like, it's just a, I say it all the time. Nope. God, my eyes are fixed on you. This is about you. And as long as I'm pleasing you, that's the only thing that matters. And your ability to stand and remain will flow from your eyes being fixed on him. So if that's you, you recognize that you've been doing all the things, but that you left your first love, you forgot your why, I want you to meet me at this altar. I just want to pray with you. Oh, is somebody here singing? Uh, I'm coming back to the heart of worship it would be great. Can we just have a moment with our Father? And whatever you feel compelled to do in this moment, I want you to feel free to do that. If you want to kneel, if you want to cry. I love that God's posture towards us is arms stretched out. But the moment you run into them, he embraces you. So I want you to close your eyes, pull in as much as you can. Because this moment is about you and your first love. Jesus, we thank you for the way you passionately pursue us. God, in this moment, we offer our hearts. Lord, I know the drift may have happened because our hearts were broken. Maybe we were disappointed. And maybe we've given even unforgiveness and our offense your place on the throne of our hearts. God, maybe it didn't pan out the way we thought it was going to pan out. Maybe we thought pursuing you was about what we could get out of you. 
But the greatest gift you could ever give us is the one you've already given, and that's you. God, you gave us you. And for us, that's enough. God, in this moment, we choose to be satisfied with you. God, that every time we take a step closer, we get to grow in a deeper depth of who you are. So God, in this moment, we're coming back to the thing that only matters, which is pursuit of you. You're not a distant God that we can only read about on pages. You're a present God. You are Emmanuel, God with us. So God, in this moment, we make an exchange for all the things that we've been holding in your position and we release them unto you. And God, in this moment, we just receive your love the love that pursues us, the love that chases us down, the love that forgives us, the love that gave up their life for us. God, we receive your love in this moment. God, I pray for every person who's at this altar, God, that you would resurrect their love for you, God, that where their eyes have been scaled with offense and brokenness, God, I pray that you'd remove the scales and give them a clearer picture of who you are. God, you're holy. God, there's no one like you. And so, God, in this moment, we repent for allowing things and situations and people to shift our focus from pleasing you. God, we repent. God, give us thick skin but a tender heart. God, break our hearts for what breaks your hearts. God, we love you, and we trust you enough to pour out our lives for you. God, you're so worth it. You're so worth it. Even the suffering and the pain and the things that break our hearts, God, you're worth it. You're so worth it. You're worth our lives. You're worth our plans. You're worth our feelings, God. Whatever we got to sacrifice for you, God, you're worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. So God, in this moment, I thank you that there'd be a drawing to your feet. God, may we trust you enough with the things that keep us up at night. God, I thank you that even in this moment, you're knitting our hearts back together with yours. God, remind us of our first love. Remind us of what it felt like when you first embraced us, where we knew we were unworthy, but we could be grateful that you chose to look upon us and see us and call us out. God, you know us by name. And we thank you that every time it gets tough and we want to walk away and throw in the town, we'll remember you. We remember that you took lashes for us. We remember that even he without sin became our sin so that we could live in fellowship with you, God. Remind us of who you are. God, I thank you that you'd give us a tender heart. God, where our hearts have been hardened, even in the place where we serve, God, we don't trust our hearts in the hands of man, but we trust you who gave us the heart. God, give us the joy of our salvation back. May we marvel in the glory that comes with your gaze. God, restore our awe of you. God, increase our hunger and our desire. God, I pray for every person in this room, God, that you would ignite a fire on the inside of us that can't be quenched by the noise of the world, that can't be quenched by culture, that can't be quenched by all the things that are happening. God, may we burn for you, God. May we burn for you. In Jesus' name, God, I thank you. I thank you that this would be... a sign and a marker that you see us. Thank you for drawing us close. God, increase our desire for intimacy with you. God, I pray a fresh wind over these young ladies at this altar. God, give them their wind back. 
where life is trying to knock them down, God, give them their wind back. Fresh wind, fresh wind. Fresh wind, fresh wind. Fresh wind, fresh wind. Fresh wind, fresh wind. Oof. 